good to see everybody out this evening. I thank you for your presence, for putting first things first and being here. And for those who might be visiting with us, we thank you for being here. and hope you'll feel welcome and come back. Some of our classes have been studying the book of Leviticus recently. And I think you've learned that the book pertains to Levi, the Leviticus. The book of Leviticus pertains to Levi. The tribe of Levi had been dedicated to the service of God as a tribe from which the priesthood would be developed and about which they would work in the tabernacle. And so we're going to look at the tabernacle. I've been requested a lesson on so that the young who have been studying this topic can see pictures of it. And so I hope that the young will in particular uh, benefit from seeing how this goes as well as those of us who are older we can certainly be enriched by it. I do not know of anything in the Bible that cannot enrich us. In fact, that's the nature of our Bible is that we've got two testaments. And the first testament is kind of building toward Jesus. So it's kind of looking forward to Jesus and telling us some things ahead of time about Him. Well, that's one of the things that the tabernacle is about. It's to tell us some things about Jesus before he gets here. Jesus said that the whole book of the Old Testament, all of it was about him. And this is about Jesus. So as we study the tabernacle, we're learning something about what Jesus was about, what his mission was. Now the Old Testament was kind of preparing the way for Jesus. And then the New Testament says when here he is and he's arrived and all the things that we've been looking forward to are all wrapped up in Jesus. So the older people, as we're looking at this topic, I believe that the older people as well as the younger people can benefit by, by seeing the shadow of Jesus in the tabernacle. The tabernacle is very powerful in this regard. It's testimony. I want you to remember that the Bible calls it testimony to Jesus. And when we talk about shadows, everybody knows what a shadow is. A shadow is something that looks like a form of something else. You cast your shadow on the ground. The sun is casting, reflecting off of you and and forming your form out there on the ground. And you see your shadow. Well, that's what the Old Testament does. It gives a shadow. It gives a vague, dark form of Jesus so that you can see the form of Jesus before he arrives. So the Bible is very, very amazing in this regard that the Jews were instrumental in in developing this shadowy form is amazing in and of itself because God not only told them that they were going to use this as well as later the bigger permanent structure, the temple, they were going to use those things and then at a certain point when God got through with them he was going to destroy that unbelieving nation as well as the temple itself. All of that to tell us that God is behind the use of this tabernacle. Now open your Bible to Hebrews chapter 3 if you will. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 3 and I'd like you to notice with me verse 1. Sometimes we get the idea that Terry likes to talk about shadows. (laughs) I like to talk about shadows. But because the shadow points us to Jesus. And it's not just me. These New Testament writers liked to talk about shadows. Look at Hebrews chapter 3. I'm looking at verse 1. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession. Who is the apostle? Apostle means somebody that's sent, and somebody that is a very high rank. He's a priest that is of a high rank. So who is this high priest of our confession? As if to say, us Christians, we have a high priest too. And who is this high priest of our confession? Now while you're looking at that, And he answers it by saying, Christ Jesus. I want you to hold your place there and turn back 
I'm looking at Exodus chapter 25. This is where the children of Israel gathered at Mount Sinai and God delivered to Moses the law as well as instructions on how to form a priesthood that would come from the Levites. Up to this point they had priests, but they didn't have them dedicated to the tribe of Levi. So now from now on, the priests are going to come from the tribe of Levi. Priests have certain duties. I want you to notice in this particular picture here that there are some of these guys wearing white. And then here's a representation of Moses, and he's doing something to this man sitting here. Well, this man is going to be the high priest, and God gave certain instructions about the exact details of the garments that this high priest was to wear. And they were to anoint him, and that's what Moses is doing now. He's rubbing oil all over his head. That's anointing him. He's anointing him as if to symbolically say to these people, God has separated out this man to, to perform these particular duties. He's going to be the high priest. And then the regular priests had duties that were under him. He's the high-ranking one. He ranks high, and that's why he's called the high priest. All the other ones were priests, but this was the high priest. All right, with that in mind, those things that, that, that are going on right here have some symbolic value. We're not going to get into all the details of that, but I will point out the basics of these are that they point to Jesus in some way. Now, notice that's why the Hebrew writer said what he said. So while you're in Exodus chapter 25, I want you to notice verse 8 and 9. Verse 8 and 9 says, And let them make me, let them, and they were to dedicate all these jewels and stones and silver and gold, jewelry, everything that they could that they could spare, that they'd brought out of, the, uh, out of Egypt, and they were to dedicate them because God wanted them to make me a sanctuary. Make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. I want a place where I can be at the center of the Israelites, and I want to dwell among them. And so make me a sanctuary where I can dwell among them according to all that I show you, that is, the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings. Just so you shall make it. I'm going to give you exact patterns and you're going to make all of this exactly like I tell you. And they was, he wasn't going to allow any deviation. He, they were going to, Moses was instructed to make it according to the, uh, the pattern that, uh, that I will show you. And then notice in verse 40 of the same chapter, he says again, And see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. You can't deviate from it because it's very important that we form this structure. It's going to be a place for me to be dwelling among you, to, be a, to have a sanctuary among you. But we're also going to make it very, very special. It is a rich place. It took, in today's currency, over a million dollars to, uh, to, uh, to furnish and build this particular structure. And they brought all of that out of Egypt when they left Egypt. And now they have instructions to use a sizable portion of what they would brought out of Egypt to build God a special sanctuary. All of it was pointing to Jesus. He wore uh, what this high priest wore is pointing to Jesus. What he wore carried a lot of symbolism that pointed to Jesus. Had a lot of symbolic value for their learning at that point in time. The regular priests, they're pointing to us. The reason I say that is because uh, Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2 says that we are a royal priesthood, talking about us Christians. So we're the priests now. So those in dressed in white were dressed in white to symbolize the purity that they were to maintain in the presence of God. 
And that's what God wants in us. He wants a a pure priesthood, a royal priesthood, and that's us. He wants every one of us to be dressed in white. But now I'm not talking about the same kind of physical garments that they're in. We're talking about white garments in the sense of a pure life. Your life is characterized by purity. If you're going to be a priest and you're going to be a servant of God, you're going to have to offer and you're going to have to maintain a purity to your character, a purity to your life, a holiness about yourself. Because you see, those regular priests were telling us something that God wanted in us. But it was just visualized, helping us visualize it in physical ways so that we could build a concept. Another thing that you notice, they wore white to symbolize righteousness. To symbolize righteousness. White symbolized righteousness, purity. And so that was the, the nature. Now, in this particular scene, you see the high priest, and he's, he's got a white garment on underneath, and then he's got a blue, and then he's got a very special uh, ephod here, and he's got, uh, uh, we'll talk about those things. But while we're there now, looking back now to Hebrews chapter 3, Paul went on, the writer of the Hebrew letter, went on to say that we've got a high priest of our confession, And he doesn't stop his sentence there. He goes on to say, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him, who appointed him. God appointed Jesus to be apostle and high priest. As Moses also was faithful in all his house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant. But I want you to notice this next phrase and underscore that in your mind, if not in your Bible, just underscore this, that Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant. Why? For a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. So why did Moses do this? Why did God want this tabernacle? It was to testify about some things that were coming later. So Moses had to faithfully build this particular tabernacle and install this particular priesthood because they had symbolic value. They had testimonial value. They testified to Jesus Christ in some way. So we're going to see now in verse 6, but Christ as son over his own house. So we're not using Moses' house anymore. We have Christ and Christ has his own house. What was Moses' house about? It was to testify about the things that we have in Christ. So Christ now, a son over his own house, and listen to this, whose house we are. We are his house. You remember in our study this past week of the book of Ephesians where where Brother Sandusky brought out the symbolism of a temple and that we're a special dwelling place. We are God's house. We are this house. Not this building, not this physical building, but these people form this spiritual house. And the apostles and Jesus are in the foundation of it. Well, Jesus Christ has a house, and we are his house. We Christians are his house. But notice there's a condition. You can be a part of his house if. That means if you don't, then you won't. But if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end, then we're his house. Well, what if you don't? Well, then you, you get, you're excluded from the house. Just like Nadab and Abihu, when they did something that they were not supposed to do, they were eliminated. 
we can be eliminated from this house, but it is a very special house, and if we maintain our confidence and we hold it fast, he says, and our rejoicing and the hope that we have, we hold that firm to the end, we're a part of this very, very special house. Now, let's look at those garments. Little, little things that you might notice about this particular thing. I'm not going to point out all the details of it. But you'll notice here that if you can see that, it might be swallowed up in the details of this garment. But there's a breastplate right here. It's a very square, square formation here. And it's got jewels, 12 jewels embedded in that breastplate. And behind the breastplate, the high priest had two particular stones that would help in his deciding things that God God's will be done. And so they were called the Urim and the Thummim. And so they were sort of yes and no uh, uh, rocks that would help in decision making. God allowed the high priest special insight to make decisions in regard to the people of God. He wore a special headdress called a mitre. On the front of that headdress was the words holiness to the Lord or holiness to Jehovah, which meant I am representing holiness to God and I'm representing that holiness to the people. And so he was a representation of holiness to the Lord and all that he was doing as he wore this outfit, this special garment dedicated to the service of God. He was to represent God and people. In other words, he mediated between God and the people. He was a go-between, someone who represented God to the people and somebody who represented the people to God. And so he was a mediator. He was mediating in behalf of God's people. He wore also the other things had some uh, representation that, uh, that pointed in some way to the heavenly connection that uh, Aaron, the high priest, the first high priest had in regard to the service of God. So he's a mediator. And in that regard, he's helping to form concepts of what Jesus was going to do, what Jesus was going to be about. Now, the book of Hebrews divides out the difference between Jesus' priesthood and the Levitical priesthood, that's the priesthood associated with Aaron, all of those priests under that law of Moses had certain duties and there were certain weaknesses associated with that priesthood because naturally a shadow is not as strong as the thing that makes the shadow. Obviously a shadow can do very little except show you an outline. But the, the image, the thing itself that forms the shadow is the real substantial thing. So Jesus was being represented by the Levitical priesthood so that we could learn some things about what Jesus was coming to accomplish. Now let's look at the contrast. In this particular chart, I'm just going to summarize right quickly the difference that the book of Hebrews gives us in regard to this priesthood. In regard to this priesthood, Jesus is a superior priest. He's actually not of the tribe of Levi. He's actually of, he's kind of like Melchizedek was. He didn't come from any particular tribe of the children of Israel. And so he's like that. He's like the tribe of, or he's like the priesthood of Melchizedek in that you don't, you can't trace him out as far as connections to previous priesthood is concerned. And he's also a king. Now the book of Hebrews also shows the difference between this priesthood, Jesus, and that of the, the Levitical priesthood. In this regard, Jesus was, let me use this particular thing, I'm going to use this pointer. He's only one priest, but he'd be the only one we'd ever need ever again. Whereas the Levitical priests, they would die and be replaced over and over. There were many priests. In this regard, Jesus is an eternal priest. He solves the need from then on. 
But in the Old Testament system, they, had, they were just temporary. They died. They got sick and died. They were temporary in nature and had to be replaced over and over until we got the permanent one, Jesus. He sacrificed one sacrifice that was suitable to God for all time, whereas they sacrificed animals. And they did it daily. And none of those animal sacrifices were ever sufficient to appease God and to satisfy the justice of God. This one sacrifice that Jesus offered was able to do that. He is holy, but they had to first deal with their own sins, and then after they dealt with their own sins, then they could help others. They were sinners. He offered sacrifices only for others because he didn't need to offer sacrifice for himself. He was sinless. However, they had to offer sacrifices for themselves first and then for the people according to the will of God. He offered himself. It wasn't a duty that was just pushed upon him that he was of this particular tribe and you got to do this because that's What tribe you're from, and you got this duty. No, he offered himself of his own will. And he offered the sacrifice of himself. They offered animal sacrifices. But that was all just imposed on them. So in the reading just a moment ago, all of it was imposed. All of this was imposed on them until the time of reformation. Now we've got to reform We've got things reformed here. We've got a greater high priest. We've got all the things that were symbolized under the old covenant. We've got it all brought together in Christ. Uh, He entered a greater and more perfect tent, a more perfect tabernacle, so that the old tabernacle they entered was a man-made tent, and it was imperfect as they were. He entered by means of his own blood into the very presence of God. They entered by means of blood of goats and calves symbolically into the presence of God. You see, there was a difference between the two. But understanding the one helps us to understand something about the greater. Understanding the inferior helps us to appreciate the greater. And so in that regard then, let's, uh, let's start taking... Uh, paying attention now to the tabernacle itself. Now, I'm hoping you're still in Hebrews. So, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 8 now. I want you to notice verses 1 and 2. Now, Hebrews 8, 1 and 2 says, now, this is the main point. And we like to get to the main point, don't we? This is the main point of the things that we're saying We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle. Notice that he's saying that Jesus is a part of the true tabernacle. That that means that the other was just had symbolic value. It was not the thing... It was not the end that God had in, means, uh, had in mind. It was a means to the end. And so the true tabernacle God was getting to was the one that Jesus is a minister of as a high priest. He's a minister of the, the, the sanctuary and the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. You see, man erected that one in the, in the wilderness, and God erected this one. And then notice also verse 5. Verse 5 says, talking about all of those priesthood and tabernacle, he says, who those priests offer gifts according to the law. And he says, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things. So the old service was a shadow of the heavenly things. So we've got something that is not visible. It's heavenly in nature, but it's real. It's not physically real, but it's real. There are things that are not physically real, but they're real. And this is a real thing too. And he says that the old system was a copy 
a shadow of the heavenly things. As Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle, for he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you in the mountain. And we read that from Exodus just a moment ago. So God commanded him to build this tabernacle. And the reason he told him to build it is because he wanted to have a meeting place between him and representatives of the people. And then God wanted to dwell among them in order to have fellowship, companionship with them. But there are certain things about the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man that makes it off limits to some extent. That is, you can't just go marching in and marching up to God any old way you want to. God has to meet out the terms of partnership, the terms of fellowship. And that's the way God has always done. The tabernacle, therefore, was, and all that, the construction of it, the courtyard, was according to the pattern set by God because God was giving the terms of fellowship. We don't make those terms. God makes the terms. We study the tabernacle to understand something about His holiness. We we understand something about our sinfulness. And we understand something about the approach that must be made in order for God to accept us. There's no question that God loves us, but accepting us is another issue altogether. And there is a means by which God accepts sinful man. And man has to come on God's terms. The tabernacle shows how common people can have fellowship with a holy God and it shows that God wants to have that fellowship. Young people, on the back of your sheet, if you've taken a copy of the the sheet that we give out or that's put out in the foyer, if you've got a copy of that, turn it over and I want you to draw. I want you to draw something. I want you to be able, in fact, older people as well. I want you to be able to, in your mind, if not on a piece of paper, you quickly be able to lay out the format, the ground plan. That is the uh, uh, how it looks on paper. How is it made out? On the outside, you'll, you'll draw a, a line represented by this white line as a white fence. It was a white fence that stood around this particular, uh, this represents the tabernacle, the tent that was made. Now there was a, there was a, uh, a fence around it, and it had one entrance. It had a curtain. You had to bring your animal to this door. It was always placed on the, toward the east. And the back end was always on the west. It was, they always had to set it up and take it down and move and go somewhere else. They'd set it up the same way every time. Had to be done exactly as God said. Now, I believe uh, Peyton and Whitley and Lily, they can tell you some things. Ann tells me that they, they, they really up been taught some well in their classes. So I want to just point out that even some of the younger people can lay this thing out and tell you what's in it. What is it there? How is it laid out? Well, it's laid out like this. It's got a fence around it. It's got a, it's got a, a, a doorway, an entranceway right here. First thing you come into is this bronze object. And it's kind of like it's got a grill so that they grill animals. Sometimes they burn the animal completely up. Sometimes they don't. It depends on the nature of the sacrifice. But they come and they have a particular reason to sacrifice something. And they tell the priest what kind of sacrifice they're going to offer. And if it's a burnt offering, they'd burn the whole thing up on that altar. So there were various reasons. The priest would then take that animal after they laid their hands on it and said, I deserve to die and this animal is going to be my substitute for right now. Then they would leave that animal into the hands of the priest. The priest would take it and and cut it up according to the nature of the particular sacrifice they were wanting to offer. And then after they did that, they would, uh, excuse me, they would then move and wash themselves. And so there are two things out here in this courtyard. Just the bronze altar and a bronze wash basin or laver. And then there was an entrance curtain into the tent. There was a tent here. And there were only three items in this particular segment of the 
uh, of the tabernacle. It was divided up into two parts. It had a curtain that divided this section from this section. So we had the holy place here and a most holy place back here behind the curtain. So when they came into this room, there were three objects here. The first object that we might notice is that it's lit up. It's got a golden candelabra with seven, seven uh, oil lamps. Not candlestick, not wax candles as we think about it. We, we must think in terms of an oil lamp up on top of a candelabra. And it had to have a wick and it had to be supplied with oil. And there were seven of them on this particular candelabra which we would call, in Jews would call that, the menorah. And so this is the golden candlestick that God told them, I want you to place that, I want you to build it according to uh, specific uh, instructions, and then I want that to be a part of what's inside this holy place. And then there was a golden altar of incense, and there was a table with bread stacked on it, 12 cakes of bread stacked on it, and those were just to show... They were showbread to remind that God's people had to be supplied with communion and, and, uh, and fellowship and reminders of the bread of life that God supplies for them. And then there was one item back here in this back room, and that was the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant was a box, and it had staves or carrying poles in it. And then on top of that box was a lid, and it had these cherubim and that was called the mercy seat and so those were the the parts of the tabernacle the tabernacle therefore was a shadow of things that were heavenly it foreshadowed the redemptive work of Jesus as we'll see in just a moment in Hebrews chapter 9 and the real tabernacle is heavenly where Jesus himself is the true and great high priest over the true tabernacle that we just read about in Hebrews chapter 8. So if you were an Israelite, this is what it would basically, basically look like. There would be in the daytime a pillar. It's kind of like a, a post, isn't it? It's kind of like a pillar. A pillar of cloud. In the night, it would, be, it would turn into a pillar of fire. That's when they were traveling so that they could know If this pillar starts to lift up and move, then God is telling us to pack up our belongings, take this tent down, take the fence down, take everything apart, and the Levites were to carry it according to a certain order, and the children of Israel in their various tents all out here take their tents down, and they would follow it. They had certain instructions on how to, uh, uh, to set it up, and how to take it down, and what to cover it with, and how to prepare to set it up again. And that was according to how they were successful they were in following the instructions of God. So now we're looking at it again, and what do we find? We find here they set it up, it's got a white fence around it, got a doorway, got the grill, or the golden, or the bronze uh, altar, uh, the bronze labor, all these were bronze Everything in here is always going to be made of gold or be decked with gold. There is some symbolism in all of this. There is one way. God says, you're not going to approach me any way you want to. There's one way to approach me. So I want you to get that visibly in your mind. You don't just come traipsing in, as some people would say. You don't just come walking into God any way you want to. There's one way. I want, you, I want to stress that, that there is one way I'm going to allow you to approach me. And that's through that one gate. There's a bronze altar, though, that says the first thing we got to take care of is sin. We got to deal with sin, and we got to deal with sin by sacrifice. So you can't just come to me without dealing with sin. You got to deal with sin. And you can't come to me without washing. You see, you got to wash. For you can enter into the holy place of God. You've got to take care of sin. You've got to sacrifice for it. You've got to wash. All of this is represented by what the priests were doing. And then you can come into this special place. Now, all the children of Israel didn't, didn't do that. They did it representatively through the, uh, through the uh, priests, the priests from the tribe of Levi. 
They were just kind of representing what God wanted them to get in their mind. That you always got, you've always to have fellowship with God. You've always got to take care of sin first. You got to wash those things away that are a part of your life. And then you can come in to the holy place of God. Now, with that in mind, you can enter. After you wash, after you sacrifice, after you wash, then you can enter. Now, that, with that embedded in our minds, we notice then that there is first sacrifice for sin. Second of all, there's washing. And third of all, there are certain things when you enter into this holy realm, this holy place of God. First of all, you're going to have to deal with maintaining the light. That's your job. That's my job. That's your job. Every one of us, if we're going to be a priest, we've got to maintain the light. Do you get that? You cannot be a priest of God if you do not maintain the light of God in your life and in your heart. Second of all, and you're in the holy place, in Christ Jesus, we have peace. Well, that's reflected by the altar of incense where they are offering something that passes through the veil that, that, uh, that connects the holy, most holy place and the holy place. And so there is the, the symbol of peace being made. The incense was a symbol of peace between God and man. And the bread symbolized resource of strength, maintenance of your relationship. And so you maintain the bread. They had to keep trading this bread. Nobody, the priest didn't eat this. This was just represent, it was just show, show bread. It was something to show. And they represented that there, there is a source of life, a bread of life that God provides in Christ Jesus, in his holy place, in this special realm. And the veil that separated said, you're not quite here yet. You're not quite there, but you're as close as you're going to get until this veil is separate, that separates you from the most holy place, then we're going to have to, you're as regular priests, you're just going to have to do these three things. Maintain the light. Keep bringing the oil in. Keep trimming the wick. Make sure the light keeps shining. That's your job. Second of all, you're to pre- present the incense that uh, is acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You are to also maintain the bread. Keep the bread fresh. Don't let it get stale. Keep the bread fresh. You see, all those things are symbolic value of our jobs. What is this church about? We're to maintain the light. We're to maintain the freshness of the bread. Keep the bread fresh. Keep the source of strength and communion with God uh, strong. And we're to present uh, prayers like incense and good deeds like incense. Those things are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And so we've got work to do in this holy place. Then there's that most holy place though, that back room. That's where the covenant was in that box called the Ark of the Covenant. That's where propitiation was made for the sins of the people, where payment was made, where the holy law was maintained and preserved in justice. God was not going to ignore it. He's going to protect his law. And mercy was on top of that. To show us that God expects us to maintain justice, but we are to place mercy at the top of everything else. Mercy is what we need. All of those things symbolizing the means by which God would bring about reconciliation with His people. So now, if you were to peel away the south wall what well, they're boards just like this that were covered with gold, as you can see them on the north wall over on the other side. We've peeled them away over here because they stood in these sockets. And then there was a pole that went through all of them to, to brace it, make it strong. There were several poles, in fact, that went through those little hooks. 
And so they had these poles through there, so that made it strong on the outside. It was covered with gold meaning it's valuable. This house is the most valuable house there is, telling us that God's spiritual house is the most important, most valuable house you'll ever have. And it also tells us something about what we're to do in that house. We see a priest now, and he's about to bring incense, and he's probably about to light it from coals that he got from outside. Where did he get them outside? Well, there was that altar of burnt offering out there. So he would bring special incense and he'd bring it in. And he'd like that from the coals for outside. Meaning that whatever was sacrificed out here made it legitimate for us to offer this incense here. That's the same way that we understand our prayers don't get past the, past the ceiling. Except Jesus has legitimized them. That's why we pray in His name. It's by Jesus that we have any acceptance with God whatsoever. So now we've peeled away and we've looked inside, and this is pretty much what you would see. It was just very small. That, that, it would fit in one segment of these pews. Not a very big thing. It wasn't a gathering place. You didn't gather in it, you gathered around it. You didn't go, go inside the courtyard, only the priest did. But you, you camped outside it, and you kept it at the center of your camp life. And the regular priest did three things in here. Maintained the oil in these lamps. Burned incense here. Kept the bread over there on that table on the north side. Kept that fresh. Traded it out as it was needed. And so that was a holy place that symbolized something very, very important. Now let's go back outside. I think. Okay, we're going back outside. We're looking at that bronze altar where they burned the sacrifice. There were coals under there, and they would take that coal inside to burn the incense to get it started. This incense was made of something very, very specially dedicated. So you can't approach God just any old way. You had to take care of sin first. That was the bronze altar. You had to wash. The, the representative of, of the priest just simply showed by symbolically that we, if we, we deal with sin, we wash, and then we enter the holy place. When we enter the holy place, we have jobs to do. We maintain the light. That's the golden lamp stand. We maintain the bread. We keep it fresh. Keep it supplied daily. We burn incense on the altar. We offer these because of what we did outside in that sacrifice. Only what we did outside legitimizes what we do inside. So you can't approach God just any old way. And then right there before the curtain is that altar of incense that, that filters through. The smoke of the incense would fill the room and filter through that, that veil and go back there where God was. As, as if to say that your good deeds smell good to God only because of Jesus and what He's done for you. Now with that in mind, let's look at that veil. That veil was the separation between the holy place and the most holy place. Back there in that back room was where the presence of God was represented. And the high priest could only go back there. The regular priest couldn't go back there. The high priest could only go back there one time a year on the Day of Atonement. And he would have to bring a certain amount of blood, a certain kind of blood, a certain sacrifice that had to be made. He had to wear a special garment on the Day of Atonement. It was a different one. It was a white one. The high priest entered the most holy place one time a year on the Day of Atonement. And he'd sprinkle blood on that mercy seat as if to say, I have no right to be in the presence of a holy God without blood. We've got to have blood to atone for sin. Otherwise, I can't even come close to God. You've got to have blood to atone for the sins of the people and my own sins. So he would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat. And that would be the means that God directed for him to be accepted into the presence of God. And one time a year they would re be reminded of their sins. Now, having said all of that, we are the regular priests. We, we are 
dedicated to God through Jesus Christ, and we put on holy garments. Remember, we are baptized into Christ. Through faith we are children of God, and we have put on Christ. That means we put on the garments of holiness, just like Christ. Not only that, but we offer spiritual sacrifices. Look with me in 1 Peter chapter 2, and just, just quickly making this observation, that he says in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 4 he says now coming to him as to a living stone rejected indeed by men but chosen by God and precious you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house you're not a physical house but you are a spiritual house you're not a real you're not a real stone but you are a living stone you are a holy priesthood What's your job? To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only reason any of us are accepted by God. See, He loves everybody, but only certain people are accepted. And they're accepted through through Jesus Christ. We offer spiritual sacrifices. We wash regularly. We wash initially as they did. And then we keep washing ourselves as we sin and confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us. We keep washing regularly. We are people concerned about getting dirt on our white garments. We keep the lamps burning. That's very important that you keep the lamps burning. Don't let it go out. If you let it go out for you, you're going to let it go out for your family. You're going to let it go out for people around you. You can't let the lamps go out. You've got to keep supplying the oil to this lamp. That's what the Holy Spirit has given you, an abundant supply of oil to supply your spiritual lamps. We keep the bread fresh. Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. You keep eating this bread, you'll always live. But if you let that go stale and you get stale toward it, then you'll die. We offer incense, good works and prayers that are accepted to God. But it's only because Jesus has legitimized it by what he did out there on the altar of the cross. And we work in the Lord's spiritual house. We work. You don't get to be a priest and not work. You're a priest. Every one of us are priests. Now, I said all of that to get to this, that Jesus is our great high priest. He's actually in the presence of God now in the real tabernacle, the real house. He's a great high priest. He's also our sacrifice. His cross is the altar of burnt offering where he's wholly dedicated to God. He is our laver in which we wash. He's the means of our washing. He is our light. He is our bread. And he is our sweet incense. And he is our way to God. And in fact, when Jesus died on the cross, that temple veil just ripped from top to bottom saying, we're through with this thing. We've got a better way to God now. Our way to God is Jesus Christ. He's our atonement. He's he's our mercy seat. In fact, the word propitiation in Romans chapter 3 is the same word for mercy seat. He's our atonement, our mercy seat. Now, we're in a time of reformation. We saw that in Hebrews chapter 9. That is, we don't use the same things anymore. We don't use the animal sacrifices. We don't use the physical tabernacle. We don't use the physical incense. The physical tabernacle has been replaced by the thing it was pointing to, and that's the spiritual, true tabernacle. The time of reformation means that we don't keep using the physical offerings. We now have spiritual sacrifices. They had physical light to maintain. We've got spiritual light to maintain. They had physical bread to maintain. We've got spiritual bread to maintain. They had physical incense to burn. We have spiritual incense. In fact, everything is new. In fact, the old argument on instrumental music, that was part of that system. That's done away. Everything is new in Jesus Christ. And that means then that we have a tremendous opportunity in Jesus Christ to have the greatest things, even better 
far better things than they had under that old system. If you've never entered into the priesthood that Christ is calling you to, he's the high priest and he wants you to be a priest with him. If you want to be a part of that, then you've got to wash in the blood. You've got to be washed in the blood exactly as God says in baptism. That is, repent of sins, confess your faith in Him, and be buried with Him in baptism. Washing those sins away, then you can enter into holy service to God.